I went for the one that does need an introduction. Um, so this is some work I did a couple of years ago with the colleague one, Dara and Magnus Vordovich. And it's about submodular functions, and it turns out that submodular functions arise from problems in conservation biology. So the connection with the confluence is submodular functions and the rank function in So anyway, let's get going. So what do they do in conservation biology? They want some measure to justify, you know, I want to conserve species as they go extinct, and you want some, some sort of measure about um, the biodiversity of a collection of species. Now, it could be to do with extinction and conservation, it could be just other things about what is the biodiversity of a collection of species, how diverse are they. Right, and wants a measure for, delete, for deciding that. Deciding that, but one of the things in conservation is not to actually conserve a single species, but to conserve a collection simultaneously. So you don't think, oh, I'm going to say, I don't know, I can't think of a French one, but you might like to think about one in New Zealand, maybe the Tuatara or something, rather than conserving the Tuatara, but rather than you know, targeting that particular species, you might target the collection, the area that the species lives in, the region that it lives in. So there's a little quote there you might like to read. And you're talking about protected areas. So somehow I've got to convert. So what you like to do is the general problem is this. I want I've got some measure, I'm going to explain what the measure will be and for the talk shortly. And I want to conserve, I've got so much budget, the, only, the, bun, the government's only giving me so much budget, I've got a bunch of regions to preserve those regions that actually have a cost, and there are species to contain within those regions. I, I want, given my budget, to, cons to conserve the species that give me the most diversity based on this measure, but keep them within the cost. So there's some areas I can afford to look after, and there's some areas I can't. Right, well, the ones I can afford to look after, because I've got a fixed budget, I've got some constraint, I want the measure to be as big as possible. Uh -huh. so that's, that's going to be the problem. All right, now the measure we're going to use is something called phylogenetic diversity, and I'll explain exactly what that is in a minute. So don't worry, I think this is the last slide of chat, and the rest is all mathematics. Um, and that's been around since phase 1992, and the Australians in the audience will be pleased to know actually Dan Faith from Australia, um, biologist. And what we're going to do, look at is, we're going to look at, in some sense, and we're going to do it, I'm going to do it more generally than this, but we're going to take a tree. And the diversity will be, I take the species and I'll be the leaves of the tree. And there'll be weights on the edges, and I want those species that are the most diverse. Or in some sense, what's, I want the tree that's going to give me the biggest subtree that's going to be the biggest weight that contains a certain collection of the leaves. Find that in a minute. All right, now it's usually with phylogeny, and phylogeny just means a leaf labeled tree whether it's rooted or unrooted, that just means the leaves, the leaves correspond to the species. Right, that in other words, phylogeny is an evolutionary tree. Right, and what we're going to do initially, we're going to do something slightly more general than trees. Right, we'll do it more generally than trees. Right, so that was the, that was the chat part of the talk, and so now here's, here's, the, here's the mathematics. So by partition, so I've got to set X. The thing of X is the set of species. Now what I'm going to do is for each, I'm going to have to take some character some, whether a species might have wings or no wings, and so I'm going to divide the species into two groups, A and B. That's called the split. All right. A may be the ones with wings, and B may be the ones with no wings. Right. It could be something as simple as that, or it could be something a bit more complicated. It could be a certain nucleotide at a particular site in the DNA sequence. So what they do is they align sequences, and they're called the sites. If you look down the column, here's the sequence running this way of the species. The columns of the sites and they align and at a certain site may have an A, and whether it's got an A or not at that site. A is one of the four nuclear types. Alright. So that's that's my I've got a collection of biopartitions, that's a split system that's traditionally called in the language of phylogenetics. And these are weighted. Each split will be weighted, so each bipartition will be weighted, have some non-zero weighting. All right. So I've got a collection of bipartitions of X, non-zero weighting. What's the PD score of a subset of those five partitions? is I'm going to sum up the weights of those splits that have a non-empty intersection on both sides. All right, so if I take um, Z is a subset of X, so I'll take a subset of X, and I'm going to weight, I'm going to include, in fact, I'm going to include those splits that have a non-empty section on both sides. So Z contains something with wings and something without wings. But if it only can contain everything with wings, and that was one of my splits, I'd ignore that split. That's not going to give E. Any value. I want things to be spread across the split because I want diversity. I want wings and no wings. Right. 
You don't need to yawn yet, James. It's only the first thing in the morning. Well, I was wondering about A vertical B. That's yeah, you know, that's a split, is it? You Sorry? Know, a vertical B is a split you notation. Know, yeah, A, B, sorry, A, B is a split, yeah. So just rather than having a copper and braces, it's just a convenient way to do it. Yeah. Sorry. So here's an example. I've got, I think I've got A up to G. And my split, and my, is my, if I said X. I've got five partitions, and they're indicated with the line down the middle, and there's some weighting. And if it's a dash, it means the remaining set. So this one, for example, I don't know how to use the pointer. Where's the... I can't use the pointer. Um, <laughs> it's the one that's above the two arrows. No, that's too complicated. Uh, <laughs> this is G versus the others. <laughs> Alright, that's, that's G versus the rest, and there is weight too. And so if I choose my subset of X to be A, B, F, all right, then what's the final jet diversity or the PD of that, of that particular subset? Well, I choose the first one, because I've got an A on the left and I've got a B on the right in the first one. If I go across the second split, A, B, G versus C, D, E, F, does that get included? Yes, because I've got A on one side and F on the other. Does the third one get included? No, it doesn't, because A, B, and F, the ones I'm interested in, are all on the left-hand side of the split. Okay, so we've got, we've got to cross both sides here to get included in the weighting. And then you go through, and so that here set is weight 12. Right. Now this particular collection was chosen actually because they could have all risen from a tree. But we're doing splits because they're actually much more general. So actually if I give you a collection of five partitions, sometimes they're the five partitions reduced by the edges of a leaf laden tree. So, for example, if I look at this, this set here is on purposely done, but if I look at this edge here and I deleted it, all right, A, B, and G are on one side, and that's the second split, and C, D, E, and F are on the other, if you look at the second split, and the weight of that particular edge was 5. All right. And the weight, from a biology perspective, the weights indicate some sort of evolutionary t distance, whether it be time, things evolved over time, or in some sense the genetic difference in number of mutations across that edge. As a relative thing, it might be five mutations, but as a relative thing. Yeah. And then actually check each of those splits there are induced by some edge. And every edge here is induced, gives rise to some split up the top. Yeah. But splits in general, I can't always do that with every collection of splits, every collection of bipartitions. How difficult is it to recognise? Easy. It's easy. Easy. It's either they, they, they can, so if I give you an arbitrary collection, forget about the weighting, if I give you an arbitrary collection, that, that'll, that'll arise from a tree, if and only if every pair can arise from a tree, or you can do it so that every pair, the crossing intersections, one of them has to be non-empty. Sorry, one of them has to be empty. All right. And they're all if and only if, so it's very quick. That's pretty easy. Yeah. All right. And if I look at the ones I was looking at, that subset A, B, and F, right, here's A, B, and F, so from an illustrative point of view, and I look at the mineral tree connecting them, A, B, and F, that's the one in green, and that gives rise to, that's exactly these splits, these edges get picked up, and there, there's the weight. Okay. So, if they do come from a tree, then that's what the cost, the phylogenic diversity corresponds to. Right. Um, now, so here's a question, so I'll do something, I was going to do something on the slide yesterday, but I talked to Jeff yesterday afternoon, we chatted, and he convinced me I don't need to do anything, to the, anything more to the slide, so I didn't. And what I was going to do is, here's something as an aside. So I give you, let's just do it, for, I'm going to do it for trees here. I'll give you a way to tree. And I, I give you, and I give you K, and K is a, is a positive integer. What's, I want to find a subset of the species or a subset of X that gives me the biggest PD score, the biggest phylogenetic, phylogenetic score, and has size K. Okay. It's exactly size K, or at most K. All right. Is that an easier and hard problem? It turns out to be a very easy problem. And actually, you can do it in a very greedy way. And what you do is, so for example, if I want one of size 4, if I was going for one of size 4, oh, I won't be drawing the phone, that would be bad, no. If I was going for one of size 4, here's what you do. For every pair, I need a starting point. For every pair of leaves, look for the longest path between those two pair of leaves. So in this case, here is a longest path. I could choose um, G up through 5 to D. So I can choose G to D. All right. take, take that. So I'm going to start with G and D. Now how do I... Um, I've got two more elements to add. 
to make it up to size 4. And what I'm going to do is, I think I've got J up to here. Now take one, now add the next one up that gives you the biggest increase. Alright, take the next one that gives you the biggest increase. So I could either add B in, or I could add E in. So let's add E. And now I've got G, D, and E. And I wanted one to size 4. Now add the next biggest one that gives me the next biggest increase, and you add B. Does, is that optimal? The answer is yes. Right, you can always do that. Okay. Charles, yeah. if you just take the smallest tree that it uses A and B and F, yep. then you get a value of 12 if you add up all the end ones. Is yep. that coincidental? The, the fact that it's 12 for the... Up there? Yeah. No, it's, a, it's exactly, exactly that. There's no, no, because each of these by partitions correspond to an edge on, on, that, on that minimal tree. So this wire partition here corresponds to this edge, A versus the rest, and then had weight one. Okay. So um, that's how you define it, is it? I suppose. Uh, sorry, yeah. So I did it for I did for a few wire partitions because you do it for this for much general structures. But when those wire partitions fit on a tree, this is this is precisely what's happened. Okay. Yeah. Right. So it turns out you can. So that's a problem you can do, and you can do it very quickly. All right. And the reason is because the underlying structure you've got is a greedoid. It's a really nice place to make for it. Uh, for those that know, and for those who don't know about greedoids, they're very much like matrix except for you don't have this hereditary property of all subsets. If you think about the independent set property, if I've got an independent set, then all its subsets are also independent. So the analogue in greedoids is feasible sets, and if I've got a feasible set, there is an element I can remove, and it's feasible. I can't guarantee all subsets are feasible, but I can guarantee I can always remove one at a time and get a smaller feasible set, one less than the previous one. Okay. Right, so we're talking about reserves. So for a weighted split system, I've got a collection R of protected reserves, and those reserves contain subsets of X. So basically what I've got is R, think of R as just a collection of subsets of X. The diversity of the subset of those regions is simply the PD score of the species contained within at least one reserve. So it's the PD score of the union of that collection of subsets. And those subsets come from a bigger collection of subsets of X. So if I give you an example, here's, here's a subset of X, A, B, C, E, and A, G, E, that's S. What's the PD score of that set? It's simply the PD score of the union of the sets. Right? There's at least one species in each of those regions. Could you consider split systems that don't arise from trees? Oh yeah, and I'll tell you about those in a minute. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. I'll give you some examples. We're going to see you'll see a couple of examples shortly. Right, so, and if I look at the tree connecting A, B, C, E, and G, that's A pin. Right, so, that's, so that's what I mean um, when you do it over cross reserves, in fact, the union of, a, of, of the reserves that I'm interested in protecting. So here's the problem. So this is the unrooted version, and we're going to do a rooted version in the second part of the talk. So the unrooted version, I've got, I've got a weight split system on X, I've got a collection R of regions, so they're just subsets of X. I've got a cost for each region, the cost of actually, you know, how it's going to cost me to preserve this particular region. And I've got a fixed budget B. And what I want to find is I want to find a subset of regions to preserve that maximises the PD score. The PD score of the species contain at least one of those regions. All right, and I've still got to, I've got to, retain, and I've got to keep within budget, of course. I can't blow the budget. So that's the problem. Um, so applications, oh, there is application. <laughs> when we when we when we uh, submitted the paper, we didn't have we didn't have these references in. And one of the referees said, "Oh, it'd be nice since it was the Journal of Mathematical Biology was the journal that it accepted for." Uh, said, "Oh, it'd be great if actually you put some you know whereabouts this has been used previously." And actually, it didn't take long. A very quick search found three straight away. They didn't have to, they had unit cost, so each region had unit cost they were doing for rather than actually having a budget. But they each had unit cost, but they wouldn't take long to find those three. So back to your question, Dylan. So what do we know about the problem? So if R consists of all the singletons, alright, so I've only got all the singletons in X, and each each one has unit cost. Okay, so what do you know? Single, if single is compatible, then actually that was the original problem I did with the tree. Four, then that's solvable in polynomial time. 
And that's simply that algorithm I just gave before. Um, the difference in the disparity of the years is that Dan Price, biologist, he knew about the algorithm, but never, never showed that it worked. You know, the, theoretically, the algorithm worked. And then independently, uh, Party and Goldman, Goldman's English and Party's Italian, and Mike Steele, a yeah, colleague of mine at Canterbury, independently showed it did work in 2005. That the algorithm did, does work. You can also get circular splits, and the circular split, circular splits are ones where you've got the elements of X, and if you put them in a circle, and each of the splits, uh, I can't write with these things, can I? And each of these splits, there's one, two, so then think of these as one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. And each of the splits correspond to doing something like that. Alright? That's a circular split, so that's more general than trees. Alright? As soon as you get one crossing, I can't get that split and that split on, the, on a tree. What I, and then you can do this problem the following over time. Affine means you can lay, so there's another more, slightly more general one, is you can put your elements of x on the plane and then every split is some line through the plane, that's affine. Affine's only two-dimensional? Yep, yep. But of course you can get more general ones than that and in general the problem's hard. Okay, so if sigma is arbitrary, all right, then it's hard. And you've got and you've still got unit cost. General. All right. If, if you go back to signals compatible, so they can all be realised by a tree, and each region has a unit cost, but you no longer have singletons necessarily, then it's hard. Okay. So variation of that problem is still hard. Um, and then Magnus and I showed in two thousand and eight that if sigma is, cap is compatible, I don't have necessarily unit cost. There is a polynomial time 1 minus 1 over e approximation algorithm for the problem. Okay. Um, and you can't do better than that. So the last part of that theorem is saying you can't do better. That's the best you can do is 1 minus 1 over e. Um, and what's that mean for approximation algorithm? It means I can find a, a feasible solution, so I can keep within the budget, and the solution's at least 0.63 of the best solution. Okay, that's what 1 minus 1 one over e is approximately 0.63. Now when we did that, we didn't realise that actually there's a really nice result. We could have done it using submodular functions. When we did that, we just did it by, without anything, just brute force, got the approximation out. Right? But in fact, if we, a little bit while later, when the more recent thing that we did, and we'll talk about shortly, if we used submodular functions, we could have got it out much, much easier, much slicker. All right, but we didn't realise there's a submodular function underlying what we're doing. So the, it's the, uh, this, this last model here with the, the straight line yeah. general function thing, yeah, that, doesn't that suggest to orienting the equation? Uh, I haven't thought about that, Henry, but it does or not. Um, so I'm not sure. There is, there, is, there is something about polyhedron going on, and Andreas Spilner, who was the Spilner at our part, that was what he did his PhD in, and I think he has done something along those lines about that, but I'm not exactly sure exactly what he's done. Mm -hmm. But you're right, you're right. There is something going on there about polyhedral things, but mm -hmm. I, my naivety tells me I'm not going to explain anything else. Yeah. All right? Because I got distracted by the other one. <laughs> you like this one? <laughs> yeah, well, this <laughs> yeah. one. So the similar <laughs> reasons, Tammy, because that, that corresponds to taking, you know, graphic co-extensions of a graphic matrix by splitting a vertex. And that circular splits corresponds to a sequence of graphic co-extensions that accumulate so that the total co-extension is still graphic. Oh, I'll have to ask you about that afterwards. Yeah, so I mean, it's quite an interesting situation. Okay, I'll ask you that afterwards. Yeah, so I just thought that it's interesting that the, where, where they're feasible, you've got yeah. a clear structure that's going on there. So. Oh, I'll ask you. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. So anyway, so, that's, so that was that. Um, and what we realise, actually, the restriction to compatible splits is completely redundant. And in fact, you can still get the same result, and of course it's best possible because compatible is a special case, of 1 minus 1 over E approximation algorithm. So for a general split system, you can still do it. And that's where submodular functions come in, because actually we got that result very easy once we realised we had a submodular function underlying the problem. Okay.
it really looks a bit bemused, but let's see where this function comes up. Okay, so for a set E, so E could be a collection of subsets. Alright, and they will be because actually E is going to correspond to our collection of regions. Right, we've got some function, alright, and that function for us would be the PD. Alright, and so mind you, if for all subsets this property holds, as we've seen before, and you can optimize, and you can, here's a problem that you can optimize and get an approximation out of arbitrary submodular functions. So I've got a non negative, so F's got to be non negative. It's non decreasing, which means that if I've, got a, if I've got a set here and I've got a subset of that set, then the value on this function has to be at least as big as the one on the value of the subset. Right, so that's non decreaser. And it's submodular. It's got to be computable in polynomial time because you want these approximation algorithms to be polynomial time. So that function has to be computable in polynomial time. And you've got a cost function, that'll be the cost of our reserves in a fixed budget B. Then you can find a subset. So, hang on, Charles, what's Sorry. the difference between your definition, your particular type of submodular function, and a polynomial? Uh, probably. I mean, the non negative, I mean, you probably don't have to have it zero in the empty set, but that's just a matter of. If you can have a zero, you don't mind zero, it's just not negative. So you're and increasing it in some modular. Yeah. yeah. So this well, polymatch wise has a function value of singletons at most k. That's but that's a, I yeah, mean, not, it doesn't yeah, have to be an integer, it could just be a non integer polymatroid. You don't have to have any bound on the yeah. value on the mm. single bit. Anyway. Why would you call so, it a polymatroid? Yeah, why? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was just curious, that's yeah. good, just to make sure I was on the right page. No, no. Sure. And so, yeah. anyway, so the, the task is to find a subset of E which maximizes F while keeping within the budget. Uh, so, I want to find a subset of E, maximize F while keeping within budget. And actually, I put it all in one hip, I should have done it in steps, but you can do it. Here's an approximation function for exactly that problem. Right. And what do you do? So the first thing you do, you find exhaustively, you've got to go through, go through all subsets of size at most two. All right. You've all subsets of size at most two. Find the best solution, call it H1. The second step is you start, and if you go to this for each subset of size three, this is the last time you just to repeat this. For each subset of size 3, what you're going to do is you're sequentially going to add elements, in this case would be our regions, to the set. But you do it, which region do you add? You're going to do it sequentially by adding the best that you get the best bang for your buck. So with the biggest in incremental increase relative to the cost of including that particular set. Because all these, all these, these things over here have got what's costs on them. So I want the best bang for your buck. What's going to be the, relatively the best increase? All right. You keep doing that until you can add no more. And you can add no more when you've blown the budget. It's like, okay, I, I've got to stop doing this once I get reached the budget. So I'm going to add, so in, in our case, I'm going to add regions to the set. Each region is a cost. I give the one that adds the biggest bang, bang for your buck, but the, co the cost of this collection I'm building up is getting bigger and bigger and closer to the B. Once it, before it reaches B, you know, the one, if I add one and it reaches B, or goes beyond B, then I stop. I throw that one away and take, and take the rest. Wait, you're starting with all possible subsets of size 3? Yeah, so for each subset of size 3, I take a subset of size 3 and I do this process. I take another subset of size 3 and do the process. And I keep doing this for all subsets of size 3. Yep. Give it, take, call the best one H2. And then, you take the, and then you compare H1 and H2, which is a bigger value. Okay. And... 2004, I'm not going to try and pronounce the name, Sarah Dinko, 2004, I suppose the frequent guess. Sure. Yeah. How can H1 be better if you've got non decreasing? Well, you may have already, each set of size 3 may have blown the budget straight away. Oh. <laughs> so actually, you take the one of best size 2. Yeah. But every time you take a collection of size 3, you. you okay. okay. So it turns out there's an approximation function. This is an approximation function for the name of. Sorry. This algorithm gives you a 1 minus 1 over E approximation algorithm for the original sub sub, uh, for the OSF problem. Just another question? Yeah? How big are the sets that would be used by biologists, by the working biologists? 
That's a fly. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so but you might, my first person I didn't fly mathematician not very good. Okay? You you fly it. So. They do. I did hear once. Okay, okay, something similar. Um, and one of the people in the audience in the Great Barrier Reef, they got these large regions with massive number of species in each region. They conserve various parts of the Great Barrier Reef. So they, it could be quite large. So it's big enough so that the complexity theory has something. It's so big enough that the complexity theory, if they really were going to do it, yes, that's just a good problem. So where's our, so here's our, so, so that 2012 result with Magnus, the, the last one I said with our few split systems, that was because we've got an underlying submodular function. So, we, so how do we get that? We've got to be slightly clever, but it's not that clever, it's just slightly clever, in that I've got to have a Q, so I've got a wave system. I've got Q to 90 of these subset of X. And when I'm going to do, I'm going to always have Q as my, in my collection of regions. I'm going to explain why, that. otherwise it's not submodular. I'm going to explain why that's in a minute. So let Q be a non subset of X. I've got R as a collection of subsets, so they're regions. Then this function, alright, which is basically, so what the PD score, which is some function, and it's going to be on Q union the subsets of, of my regions that I take. So I've always got this fixed Q. So Q is just a subset of X, it could be a region already. But it may not necessarily, it's just a subset of X, it must be non empty. So it has, you might have it so it's just a singleton, contains a singleton. All right? Then that's a submodular function. And the reason you need a singleton is because of this. Take the tree example. Let me find this is here. Right. Oh, here's, here's one set, D and E. Here's another set, A, B, and C. Submodular function says that the PD of this plus the PD of this is at least the PD of their union plus their intersection. But if I take their union, the union additionally includes this edge here, and therefore it won't be a submodular function. But if I've got one of the sets always included, I've got some sort of root, if you like, and I've always got to include that guy, then I do get submodular function. Right. So it's not submodular if I don't have this particular set Q sitting there. Is that right? Baker? <laughs> Still nods his head. So I take that as a, as a consensus agreement. Right. So what we do is we're going to choose to be at E, F, C, and B in the, in the general situation. I'm going to choose R minus Q for E, the PD of that score, the cost and P minus the cost of having Q. Okay. And then that's approximation, and is a, if I apply approximation function, which was the algorithm, and that's a polynomial time, one minus one over the algorithm would be in RS. But the set to reserves have to include Q. I don't want Q, but how do you get around that? We well, always run it over all, for all values of Q. And one of those ones will give you the optimal solution. So by running through each possible choice for Q, we get a polynomial type 1 minus 1 over approximation algorithm for B and R S. Right, so you have to run it over. So you fix Q, but you, you run over all various values of Q. One of those regions will be in there in your optimal set, and you choose the best one. For all choices. So it's obviously something to understand, but yeah. according to my calculations, there's exponentially many choices for Q. No, okay, so what we can do is I'm going to choose Q as one of my original regions. So what I'll do is I've got a collection of, I was given a collection of regions. Oh, right. And I'll choose Q to be one of those regions. Oh, I see. So, so you've I've got, got this it. bounded number. Of yeah, I should have said, I don't explain that very well yet, yeah. but I'll I could have done the way I've done it there, but in practice what you do is you've got a collection of regions, I'll Q, choose Q to be one of those regions. Right. And then you run it over through all the regions. And then, you know, it's not, but it's not polynomial time, it's not as the input, but of course there's an exponential number of these, I don't, I don't mind, right? Oh, that's right, part yeah, of the yeah, input. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's Charles, just a yeah. question about, doing stuff over different regions. Surely what happens in one region is not going to be related necessarily to what happens in another region and therefore... Yeah, well we do we do play the game assuming they work, they work independently and things like that. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to make assume that, that things are working independently. I think, then it's more complicated if you don't, you know, and I don't know how to do that. That's not the case. It, it, that's going to rise particularly in the next one when we're going to extend it, we're allowed... You know, just because you're saving a region, there's a guarantee that I'm going to save this region so these things will survive and the regions I don't look after 
they're all going to die out, which is what we're playing at the moment. That's the game we're playing at the moment. So if I don't look after a region, then do all those species that aren't in one, aren't in one of the regions I'm looking after, do they all die? Of course not. Right, so, but we're going to assume independence for that. But that's not necessarily, because that's not true. So, here's the, so that's the unrooted setting. Here's the rooted setting, but rather than after you split this, we'll do it on rooted trees. So I'm just going to have a rooted tree where the leaves are labelled with the elements of X. And this time, as the sum of the edge weights, is that the same thing, but we always include the root. All right, so the PD score of any subset, so it's a rooted tree, the edges are weighted, the leaves are labelled with the elements of X. But any time I include the PD score of a subset of X, I'll always include the root as well. Um, in the root setting, it's still it's pretty much exactly the same idea, you don't do anything special, but it's still a 1 minus 1 over any approximation algorithm for it. Um, but can we, but the question question is, can we extend this in some way while still maintaining the property of polynomial time 1 minus 1 over e? So we don't ruin the approximation algorithm, we still maintain that level of an approximation algorithm for it. And we're going to do that, we're going to do, we are going to extend it three different ways. The first way is sort of, sort of the most tr the trivial way in some sense. And what we're going to do is, actually in practice, what happens is, the things you might see as an evolutionary tree is what's called a species tree. But actually genes don't necessarily evolve the same way that species evolve as a whole. There's things called lineage sorting, other various activities going on, that cause genes, the, 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 the evolutionary tree for a gene doesn't have to be the same as the evolutionary tree for the species. Different genes can evolve in different ways. They don't have to like follow the, you know, follow the way the species evolve. So you might have a collection of trees. The other thing I was just talking about before, James, with James before, is about it's unrealistic. Just because I decide to keep it, keep an area, everything there has got probability survival one, and those who I don't look after have got probability survival zero. You don't expect that to happen. So some, what would you like to have is you like each species to have some sort of survival probability. And if I'm going to protect the region, you'd like that species to have a better chance of surviving than if I don't protect it. <laughs> so you make that assumption, or we're going to make that assumption. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. right. And the last one is that what happens with PD is you sort of, if, if you think about the rooted case, some feature arises, whatever that feature may be, and then it survives all the way down to the leaves. But there's no reason for a feature to survive. There's no re reason that you might not have, have some ancestral species has a tail, then as you go down some lineage that, or some sort of branch or path down the tree, I'm going to say lineage, but that's what the biologists call it, down some path in the tree, you lose the tail, and then later on, for some reason, you pick up a tail again. There's no reason for that not to happen. Okay? So it's not, so, so some features could disappear, is what I'm trying to say. Okay? Some features could disappear. And so we're going so to allow that, where once a feature has, once a feature is present, and has a constant memoryless probability of E minus lambda of surviving at each step. So there is a possibility of losing that feature. The things can be lost as well. Um, I think I've been slightly... Oh, so each element has a probability P of X of survival. And this time, because we've got we're doing the probability, we expect it's now the expected number, or the expected PD, if you like. Okay, expected number of features, or well, the expected PD is what we're interested in now. So what we're interested in is this, is this the PD here. And so T is some point in our tree. So this well, is not only is it applied, you've actually got integral signs. <laughs> <laughs> Even cruel, I know. So this is going to integrate over um, all points in our tree T. And it's the probability that 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 feature that arises at, at that particular point of the tree survives into some species in the X. Okay. It's a, but why is that an integral sign? Why isn't it just a summation? It's just a discrete process, isn't it? Evolution's not a discrete thing. Like, it's not an, no, it's, you've got a tree, and you can rise. So what do you have you got, as you go along? If you go from some vertex U to some vertex V, you've got some length here. The things are just arising, they're constantly arising. So the, the things that arise there is a proportion across the length. So the integration is with respect to time, is it? Yeah, it's a, the, the rooted thing. So we, don't, we can't have this in the unrooted setting because we don't have a notion of time in the unrooted setting. But in the rooted setting, we've got a notion of time going from the root down to the present day. 
the roots of the past in the present day, the leaves at the bottom. Okay. Um, and, it's, that's, and the bit about having a collection of trees isn't, isn't really almost irrelevant, but you can weight the trees and you do this across each individual tree. Okay, so, you sum up, so you can weight the trees depending on, if you think your gene, this gene thing is you know, more relevant than others, you can give them extra weight if you like. So the important part really is the green part, not, really, not the blue part. But you can extend it in that way. So what's the root of setting? We've got a collection P weighted trees on X. You've got a collection R of regions, paying species in X. So you've got a cost for each region, if you want to preserve it. You've got a fixed budget, it's all the same fixed budget. You've also got this sort of here, XR, which means that the, the probability of X surviving in region R so XR is the probability of X surviving in the region R. And you've got two choices. You've got this one, and you use this one if you don't decide to save that region, but there's still a chance of, you know, of X surviving. And you choose this one if you choose region R and X is in it, then that gets that. And so you assume that if I'm going to save things, you're more like there's a chance of, you know, of surviving in that region than in a region that hasn't been, isn't been preserved. Where the greater than equal sign comes into. And it's the same problem as before, but find a subset R part of regions to preserve that maximizes the expected PD score while keeping within budget. Okay, so that's the problem. And it turns out that's submodular. That function that's the first one didn't require much work, this requires a lot more work to get it to be submodular. Uh, there's a lot more work to get in this and if you feel the name more time. The rest sort of fell out, this one's a lot more work to get. Okay, so that function is not needed, non-decreasing submodular, and it's computable in polynomial time. So given that, I applied, applied Spiri Denko's 2004 result, and we can get a 1 minus 1 over E approximation out of for that problem. And that is that's the end of the talk. <laughs> That's fine, we sent it on. So Still. this factor of 1 minus 1 over E, I got a little bit muddled with the chronology, but you had a 1 minus 1 over E approximation algorithm, yep. and somebody else had uh, an no, approximation no. algorithm. No, so we had approximation 1 minus 1 over E in 2008, yep. that was for when SIG was compatible. Yeah. So with the set of, and it's still the nature reserve problem, but the collection of splits were compatible. Yes. Right. So we did that, and then what we realised, and then in two thousand, in the two thousand and twelve result, yes, we upgraded to our few splits since we still got the one minus one over e. You could still maintain that. Yeah. You could only got it couldn't have got any better. Right. There was somebody else's approximation algorithm for optimizing a submodular function which had the same effect. Right, but Sarah Dink Dinko did it for arbitrary submodular functions. Yes. Alright. And yeah. so what you could do so what we realised to show is, oh look, yeah. if we can show that this is what we're op optimizing the submodular function, yeah. then, then we can just wheel in the general result. Yeah. Alright, and, and that's what we did. Was the fact that you had the same approximation factor before what, what clued you into it? No, we we didn't know anything about Sarah Dinko's result, right. even though his result appeared you know, it was done before us. Yeah. We did not. The idea that we we're working with submodular function didn't even no. register. Yeah. And you didn't, you didn't know his result at that time. We didn't know the so result. We, so we used a brute yeah. direct. We just did a direct approach for doing it. So and that, the proof's quite long. So that one minus one over e must have leapt out of you when you saw his result. Yeah. So we saw his result. Like, Whoa. Okay. And then submodular. Yeah. And we realised submodular. Oh, hang on. Something's yeah. going on here. Yeah. <laughs> and we put the two and two together, but we didn't realise the first start. Yeah. yeah. No. It's. it's it's kind of nice that you arrive exactly with the same factor independently for completely different reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, Charles, something that slightly messes with the head. It's not it's to right. do with anything in your talk, but it's to do. I have a very strong feeling that if Jack Edmonds were in the room here, it had nothing to do with your result, but he would have said that that result of Sarah Beck is, oh, because it's, you know, that really, they yeah. really are poly polymatroids in the sense oh, that Jack so Edmonds. Disguised as something else much Jack earlier, Edmonds so used to use the sense of the world. That's how. That's what Jack would call a polymatroid. You know, real valued functions, blah blah blah. 
And if Jack were here, I'm sure he'd say, oh, that's just a special case of something I've proved years and years and years ago, and in fact, I got an exact result. But that's, I mean, I, I don't know, it's just... You, have you looked you at your older patients? You won't get an exact result because it's hard, So you right? can't get an exact result. No, because yeah. the problem is hard. It's about because yeah. we're just a you know we've done here's a particular instance where it's hard. Yeah. So we don't know it's hard. Yeah. Now whether I mean was the idea of approximation. I mean this was a historical thing, but did Jack work on approximation? No, he didn't. It's just I, I just it's probably just my failing to understand what was exactly going on in that. Yeah. So the, in general, the problem's hard, even in a very yeah. particular yeah. special instance on some modular functions. Yeah. The problem's hard yeah. in general. But I, but so, maybe somebody else in the literature in disguise in and in another. It would no, not but I don't think it. Jack would have ever done an approximation. In terms of approximation you know, the outcomes, right? That sort yeah. of stuff he did on polymatrix. Yeah. Just, just be surprising. Are there other examples of where you can use this submodular uh, function? I don't, I don't know of anything in phylogenetics, but I mean, there may be... I mean, that, but there was part of the reason for giving the talk here. I mean, I've given, I go, I go, I've given the talk before, but I've given it, you know, not to <laughs> people that know anything about not to people who know something about submodular functions, right? So the purpose of the talk was to to get to hear us being doing about submodular functions. And I just, so and I'm curious. Model. Yeah, does it? I don't know. The whole yeah. theory is not going to be subsumed under submodular function optimization. <laughs> but phylogenetics will stop. Yeah. No, no. I don't know. Of any, I don't know of anything else in the area that that to do with sub to do with submodular functions and optimizing. But you know, it's not. You know, I don't know. Did any, I think you may not. Did anyone else know about the, the approximation out in Sarah Dinko's result, 2004? And it's relevant to here. Well, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> possibly not. I don't know. But we certainly didn't know about it at the time, and we, we latched onto it afterwards. Yeah, we realised, suddenly realised we were working with submodular functions. What, what happened, the order in which we did it was, I think, we started working, realised, oh, look, we've got a submodular function. God, there's a huge literature on submodular functions. And that's where we latched on to Sarah Jenko's result. I think that was the order we did it in. Not that actually we realised the 1 minus 1 over 8, but more the fact we realised we were getting some modular functions. And then, oh, hang on, there's a huge literature on this stuff. Let's latch on. I'm not reinventing the wheel. What can we find out? And then we found out that, and then we, that's what happened. Yeah, Dominic was always on the lookout for some modular functions. Oh, was he? Yeah. Must have come from the magnets. Your academic brother, sibling. <laughs> 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 All right, I'll leave it there.